Thank you, Dr. Willett. Um, our next presenter is Dr. Stephan Guillenet of the University of Washington. Uh, Dr. Guillenet received his bachelor's in biochemistry from the University of Virginia and his PhD in neurobiology from the University of Washington. His current research focuses on the neurobiology of body fat regulation. His presentation is entitled The American Diet, a Historical Perspective. Please uh, join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Guillenet. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Can everyone hear me? OK. So my name is Stefan Guillenet, and I'm going to be speaking about the history of the American diet. This talk does not represent the views of the Un University of Washington or my mentor, Dr. Schwartz. I'd like to start with a simple question. Why does our diet history matter? To begin to answer this question, let's go back to 1892 when the US government collected height and weight measurements from a representative sample of Caucasian US men. And using these numbers, we can calculate the body mass index of these people and thus the prevalence of obesity at the time. And what we see when we look at this is that in age groups from 40 to 69 years of age, the prevalence of obesity was below 4%. In contrast, in the year 2000, a different picture had emerged in the same demographic. Approximately a quarter of people in the 40 to 49 year old age group were considered obese and the prevalence increased with advancing age. So this trend here on the left is typical of non-industrialized cultures, whereas on the right it's more typical of industrialized affluent nations. And along with an increase in obesity prevalence has come an increase in the incidence of heart attacks, diabetes, and a number of other conditions that are collectively termed the dis diseases of affluence or diseases of civilization. So to get back to the question that I posed in the last slide, the reason we care about the history of the US diet is because diet is one of the major determinants of chronic disease risk. So if we understand where we've come in that same time period, perhaps we can get a handle on what it means to eat a healthy diet. So the second question is, how has our diet changed over this time period? And what I'm going to show you during the course of this talk is that it's changed rather dramatically, both in the types of foods that are consumed and particularly in the way those foods are prepared. So in 1800, most people lived on or near farms, and food was relatively restricted and seasonal, restricted in terms of food choice. And cooking was done on an open hearth, which is a relatively labor-intensive form of cooking. That continued to be the case until about 1820 with the development of the cast iron stove. And that was the standard cooking method until the 1920s with the introduction of gas and electric ranges. Also in the 1920s came the introduction of electric refrigerators, which allowed more efficient storage of produce, such as vegetables and meat. And then also in the 1920s came the proliferation of grocery stores, which along with improvements in transportation and storage, allowed the diversification of the diet, as well as gave a platform for the sale of commercially prepared foods. And since that time, there's been a proliferation of labor-saving devices in the kitchen. So you would think that with all this labor-saving technology, people would be cooking more and more of their own food. But ultimately, all of this was supplanted by the ultimate in labor-saving technology, which is commercially prepared food. And we can see the traces of this in this graph here, which shows the patterns, uh, which shows the percentage of total food spending on food eaten either at home or away from home. And what we can see is that in 1889, 93% of all food spending was on food to be eaten at home, whereas in 2009, that number was 51%. And in fact, I think this greatly underestimates the magnitude of the change, because in 2009, a lot of the food that was consumed at home was actually commercially prepared food. And if you look at that red wedge there, that's fast food consumption. Between 1960 and 2009, that increased from 2% to 18% of total food spending. So the US diet 
over this time period has seen a radical change from simple home-cooked food to commercially prepared food. And another place where we can see interesting trends is in the pattern of wheat flour consumption. So in the 1700s, wheat flour was relatively expensive and was consumed in large quantities, mostly by the wealthy. However, this began to change in 1790 with the development of improved milling technology, which drove down the price of wheat flour. And that trend continued in 1834 with the development of the mechanical reaper, 1837 with the development of an improved plow, and then in 1880 by the development of steel roller mills, which allowed the production of a whiter form of flour, which, although less nutritious, was preferred by consumers and was able to be stored and transported more effectively and thus more cheaply. So this trend continued until the turn of the century when wheat flour consumption began to decline. And this was due to the diversification of the US diet, including the addition of sugar and dairy, increased vegetable consumption, greatly increased poultry consumption. And that continued until about 1970 when wheat flour consumption bottomed out and then began to increase again beginning around 1980. And the increase was due mostly to an increase in the proliferation of commercially prepared wheat-based foods. So another place where we can see the traces of these dietary changes is in what that wheat flour was being used for. So over the last century, there's been a very uh, major shift between home use of wheat flour to commercial use of wheat flour. Another place where we can see the traces of diet industrialization is the, in the consumption trends for potatoes. So between 1960 and 2007, total potato consumption increased modestly. However, the consumption of fresh potatoes declined by 50%, whereas the consumption of processed potatoes, primarily french fries and potato chips, increased by fourfold. And if we do a proportion on that, the proportion of processed potatoes increased over that same time period from about a quarter to about two-thirds of total potato consumption. And if we look at trends in the fats that we use for cooking, about a century ago, the predominant dietary uh, added fats were butter and lard, and these gradually declined in popularity over the course of the last century to be more than replaced by margarine, shortening, and refined seed oils. And as you might imagine, the total consumption of added fats over this time period increased considerably. And if we look at the composition of the total fat in the US diet over the last 100 years, saturated fat consumption has remained relatively stable. Monounsaturated fat consumption has increased by 64%. And polyunsaturated fat consumption has increased by a whopping 300% due to increased consumption of refined seed oils primarily. And these are things like soybean oil, corn oil, sunflower oil, etc. And this is also reflected in our body fat stores. So the predominant fatty acid in seed oils, for the most part, is linoleic acid. And between 1961 and 2008, there's been a dramatic increase in the proportion of linoleic acid in body fatness, in, in body fat, it's gone from about 8% to about 20%. And those changes are also reflected in breast milk composition. So the full consequences of this departure from historical norms are not fully appreciated at this time. Macronutrients have also changed over the course of the last 100 years. Carbohydrate consumption 100 years ago was relatively high. It declined by mid-century and then rose again, beginning around 1980. Fat consumption has gradually increased, gradual modest increase, and protein consumption has increased slightly but remained relatively stable. And if we look at the contribution of each macronutrient as a proportion of total calories, protein intake has remained almost completely constant. Fat intake has increased from 31 to 41 percent, and carbohydrate uh, consumption has decreased from 57 to 49 percent. 
So the diet has become more fatty and less starchy over the last 100 years. Sugar is another place where we can see the traces of diet industrialization. In 1822, the average American consumed the amount of added sugar in one 12 ounce can of cola every five days, whereas today that same number is every seven hours. And those changes have been driven by changes both in food technology and food culture. So, for example, the introduction of granulated sugar in the 1870s allowed people to add it very easily to almost any food. The development of a mechanical glass blower drove, in 1899 drove down the prices of sweetened beverages. In the 1920s came the introduction of refrigerated soda vending machines, which increased accessibility. And then in the 1970s came the uh, replacement of cane sugar with high fructose corn syrup, which was very cheap and allowed manufacturers to add it to just about anything at virtually zero cost. And much of the increase in sugar intake has been driven by increased sweetened beverage consumption. It's increased five-fold between 1947 and 2005. So are you thirsty yet? How about now? Images like these are used by food manufacturers to drive purchase and consumption behaviors. And this has been going on for a long time. And some of the more egregious examples from the 1960s and 70s, I'm going to show here. These are from the sugar industry. And they're claiming that eating ice cream and candy an hour before a meal is an effective weight loss aid. <laughs> so processed food manufacturers are using advertising to drive purchase and consumption behaviors. But another thing that they're using is extensive engineering of foods to maximize palatability and the likelihood of repeat purchase. And to drive home that point, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you the ingredients list for a typical fast food strawberry milkshake. So this is the basic uh, shake mix. It's a lot of dairy, a lot of sugar, and some mystery ingredients in there. And then this is the syrup mix. Again, a lot of sugar, some more mystery ingredients. It's clear that some people put a lot of thought into this ingredients list. But what is this? Artificial flavor. So the ingredients of artificial flavorings are proprietary. So they're not required to disclose those ingredients. However, what I'm going to show you is a, is a typical ingredients list for artificial strawberry flavor. It looks something like this. So the point here is that this is an extensively engineered food designed to maximize palatability, minimize, or excuse me, maximize the likelihood of repeat purchase, and minimize production costs. But not only has our food been engineered, our very culture has been engineered to promote the consumption of these foods. For example, in the United States, the two most recognizable fictional characters to children are number one, Santa Claus, and number two, at 96%, Ronald McDonald. And many of you may know that old St. Nick himself has been peddling Coca-Cola since the 1930s. So food manufacturers are using professional engineering and cultural engineering to drive the purchase and consumption of these foods. And as one might expect, not surprisingly, this has been accompanied by an increase in calorie intake over the last 40 years. So calorie intake between 1970 and 2009 has increased, and this is average per capita, increased by a full 425 calories per day, a 20% increase. Now, estimates range on this between about 250 to 570 calories per day, but everyone agrees that there's been a large increase. And interestingly, you can see that the increase started about 1980, which corresponds with the dramatic increase in obesity prevalence in this country. So if we're looking for an explanation for the obesity epidemic and the diabetes epidemic, this is a good place to start. <laughs> 
So in summary, the traditional American diet is simple, it was homemade, it was composed primarily of minimally refined ingredients, it was low in added sugars and fats, with the fats coming primarily from animal sources, and it required effort to produce. In contrast, the modern American diet is much more diverse. It contains a lot of hyperpalatable items. It's commercially engineered. It's composed of refined ingredients. It's high in added sugars and fats, with the fats coming primarily from seed oils. And it requires minimal effort to procure and consume. At the same time, as modern medicine has conquered the leading killers of the 19th century, such as infectious disease, modern food culture has created a whole new set of epidemics that it's now our challenge to face. I'd like to thank Jeremy Landon for helping me out with some of these statistics, as well as the USDA Economic Research Service and all the other researchers whose dedicated efforts allowed me to put this talk together today. My website is Whole Health Source at wholehealthsource.org. Thank you very much.